بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Which Quran do we read? Why do we let these radical imams brainwash some of us? We come here, we sit, we sleep in khutbas, we don't get the message, that's why we miss it. All I need you to be grateful, Allah. Are you telling me Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not protect the, the prestige of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only living for business? That's all our dream. Let me see who shall save you now. Matter. Nobody, nobody. I have no control right now. Look at the armies, look at the power, and I know you will take you your house. You want to see two Muslims, a Salafi and a Tabliki, smiling and making jokes together? They'll be trying to kill each other. Alhamdulillah, in Ahmaduhu, and Astainuhu, when a star of fear who were not meno be he, when at the Wakalu Alay, when I would be lahim shururi and Fusina, Waming Sayyati Armalina, Mayahdi Hillahu, Fala Molilla, Wame Yolilahu, Fala Hadiala. ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وَحْلُ الْأُقْدَةً مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي اللهم ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم ربي يسر ولا تعسر وتمم بالخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم صدق الله صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين أما بعد الحمد لله all praises and thanks are due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى for once more blessing us to be here today to perform the Salat al Jum'ah the Friday congregational prayer and to listen to the khutbah inshallah once more, alhamdulillah, all praises and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for choosing us to belong to the ummah or the followers of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I pray and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'in. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon each and every one of us, to shower his hidayah upon us, to shower his forgiveness upon us, and to shower his acceptance upon us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala once more to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon me, by giving me the permission and the ability to be able to fulfill this responsibility in delivering the khutbah or sermon, inshallah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower unto me the quality of tawakkal ala Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge, and the ability to fulfill this responsibility, inshallah. I put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most sufficient. Today, alhamdulillah, 
we are in a new Islamic year. We are in a new Islamic month, the month of Muharram. Based on calculation, the moon was born on Tuesday night, that is Tuesday the 13th, at 10 o'clock more or less, which means that it was only visible on the evening of Wednesday the 14th, which means that yesterday was the first of Muharram. And today is the second of Muharram. According to some calendars, they do say that today is the second, uh, the third of Muharram. <clears throat> so whatever it may be, we will always have this technicality about visibility and calculation. But whatever it may be, next week, inshallah, if today is the second of Muharram, the next week, Saturday, will be the 10th of Muharram, inshallah. And according to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are recommended to fast on the day of Ashura. And we are recommended, according to Hadith, to fast on the 9th and 10th, or on the 10th and the 11th, which will be Friday next week and Saturday, or Saturday and Sunday, inshallah. And as I was mentioning last night, and I need to remind myself and you a little recap of what we were talking about last night in our Thursday night nasiha or reminder, Allah. Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she reported that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says and said that when, when Ramadan became faraz on the Muslims, he then said it was up to you and it was a choice to fast on the 10th of Muharram or not. And my job is only to remind myself and you of what the laws are. But the ulama and the fuqaha generally recommend that we fast because the Prophet ﷺ had said that he would fast on the 9th and the 10th or the 10th and the 11th. And according to history, he passed away before that. But in his life, it is recorded that he used to fast on the 10th of Muharram even when he used to live in Mecca before he came to Medina. And then when he came to Medina, and the Jews were fasting on the 10th of Muharram. And he asked them why they fasted on this day. And to just let you know and myself, even till today, Jews fast on the 10th of the first month of their religious calendar. Very interesting. So the same principle and mindset has been there. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he was told by them that they fast on the 10th of Muharram because Musa alayhi salatu wasalam, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, Allah caused him to cross the sea successfully, open the ocean, and had him walk with the people. So it was a day of great barakah and blessings and success for Musa and the Israelites. May Allah be pleased with that. Hence the Prophet ﷺ on that occasion said, and we, the Muslim Ummah, have more rights over Musa ﷺ. So he recommended the Muslims to fast on the 10th of Muharram. And then said that he wanted them to fast on the 9th and 10th, or the 10th and the 11th, not only the 10th. Um, there are many, 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 many rewites pertaining to Muharram, and specifically the 10th of Muharram. Some are very authentic, some a little shady. But the bottom line is, the 10th of Muharram is a very auspicious day in the history of Islam. The 10th of Muharram is a very auspicious day in the history of the believers. 
The 10th of Muharram is a very historic and unique day in the history of the lives of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam, the prophets. The 10th of Muharram is a very unique day for insan or human beings in general. Interesting. For mankind in general. Now there are a lot of details pertaining to this, but sometimes we cannot grasp all at one time in a khutbah. So it's always recommended we do some research and go and check it out, inshallah. And I don't want to get too much into history here, because a lot of us love to hear history, and then we don't practice what we learn from the history, and then we die and we become history. And that was just it. We just hear history and we become history. And nobody learns and nobody does anything. So what I want to do, bi'ithnillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the second khutbah, brothers and sisters, is to remind myself anew that now that we have embarked in a new Islamic year, the non-Muslims and the world at large, they make the 1st of January a big thing. They make the eve of their new year a big thing. They make a lot of resolutions when the new year comes. Some of us Muslims don't even know we're in a new Islamic year. Hmm? Some of us don't even know a birth according to the Islamic year. If I were ask a few of you brothers, how many of you know your death, what year you born? I wouldn't tell you what year I born in the Islamic year because you'll know my age. But, according to the Islamic year, you are older in years. If you're 55, then Islamically you're, you're about 60. 54 to 60. So if Brother Azad is 69, he's about 80. Well, I'm just kidding. So, and Allah will judge us according to the Islamic year, not according to the English calendar. But the Islamic year is judged according to the lunar calendar. And the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam and the prophets live their lives and run their businesses according to the lunar calendar. Don't we do Ramadan according to the lunar calendar? When the moon is sighted? Or when the new moon is born? Don't we do Hajj when the new moon is born? And we told that the new moon is the time, go check Surah Baqarah, the new moon is the time Allah says that he has designed for us to calculate and mark our occasions, know our hajj and everything else. So our years are really calculated by the new moon. And it's easy, you could go online and calculate. There is a hijra calendar and there is the um, English calendar and you can compare and know how old you are. So I really like to know how old brother that is really. And some of you and myself. Muslims don't hide age, you know that. I was just kidding when I told you I don't want you to know my age. I'm a young 53. Everybody say I'm 35. <laughs> but anyhow, there's, that, that's a superstitious stupidity to hide age. What are you hiding age from? Men hiding age, women hiding age. When I have to perform marriage ceremony for people, I say, what's your date of birth? He said, we don't see our date of birth. I said, well, go get somebody else to do marriage because I don't know if you're underage or you're overage. You need to know the age. To know whether you need your parents to stand by your side or you could stand for yourself. That's an important law in Sharia. Whether you're not balik or you're balik or over the age of maturity or whether you have to get parents' consent because you cannot marry under 18 years in America. Oh, yeah. See, they, they, just like, that, that's a stupidity, and I call it stupidity. That's a, I don't know what world is that, and I don't blame the West for that. I blame you humans, stupidity for that. What you hiding? Some of us, you could see your age in your face. You're 40 years, and you look like 60 years. So why hide it? Oh, if you're 60 and you look like 40 and sporty, well, that's a whole different thing. And that's how it should be. But back to the point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the prophets, peace be upon them, they lived their lives and calculated their businesses according to the lunar calendar. The Jews did it, the Christians did it, and all the prophets in the past did it. 
The English calendar is a man-made one, and I'm not telling you don't follow it. Follow it because you might be thinking today is Sunday and you won't come for Juma. So you need a calendar. Check it out. And according to some fuqaha and Islamic jurist, subhanallah, they have gone so much down into the research of the English calendar in comparison to the Hijra and the Islamic calendar to show that their shortcomings are not 100% accuracy in the English calendar. That's why the Jews and the Christians and the Muslims in the, in the years before always used this, the, the moon, the new moon cycle, the farmers, the almanac. Go check it out. The, the planting, the hunting, everything was to do with the lunar calendar. Even till today, you go in some of the supermarkets and you get a lunar calendar to do your business, the plants, to plants, to get married, to do a lot of things. They, they, they go by that. And then they went down, if you're thinking, technically, to say that you got a leap year every four years. Then you have the 30, 31 days. So you, you, you lose, you add. Then you go to some other places, and because they go by sunrise and sunset, because of six months uh, or, or sometimes a night and sometimes a day, you have a miscalculation of accuracy. The place that have sun for six months and night for six months or three or seven, as the case may be, it is only by the lunar calendar that you get the full accuracy of a balance. That's why Islam is so sophisticated and modern. There is no shortcomings in it. But let's get off that astronomical, mathematical kind of technicality with the English calendar. The point I want to get to is the real message to myself and you, inshallah, on the second khutbah, ba'iznillah, inshallah. Now that we are in a new year, and a new Islamic year, we need to be a better people. We need to make some changes. We need to think, rethink, calculate, look at our lifestyle, look at how much we have done, just as we do before we sleep in the night. What have I done today? Just as you do in your business every day, how much have I made today? Just as you do on a monthly basis, did we work with the budget this year, or are we over or under? Just as we do every year to see if business is making or not, should we close shop or not? And some smart people do that every day before they sleep. They check what has happened for the day and what they're going to make a better day tomorrow. So similarly, as we get into a new Islamic year, this is the month of Muharram. Today is the second of Muharram, inshallah. We need to make some changes. So at least the minimum we should do is make the intention to be a better Muslim to do more better amals and good deeds in this new year. Because as we add into the years, we lose our years. As we add years and we go up in years, we go down in age. We go up in figures, but we go down in our stage of life. We go up in age, numbers, but we go down in stage. We become weaker, we become feeble, we become forgetful, and we deteriorate. And that's one of the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To show his kudrat and power, how he has created us, from a drop of sperm to a baby into a man, a strong, healthy man or woman, and then we deteriorate. These are the signs, and Allah has reminded the people to ponder over his signs. And it doesn't matter what doctor we are, and what lawyer we are, and what scientist we are, and what researcher we are. We cannot do that better than that. You could go and make a facelift. You call it plastic surgery. You know, plastic surgery, a whole body. Uh, you probably want a plastic surgery, a face, and people think you look a little better. But inside, you're really weaker. You put on a wig on your head. In hakikat and reality, it doesn't matter what they do temporarily. It's just a show business. But in reality, that's a sign that Allah has said to insan and human beings that you are the makhluk, the creation. And Allah says, he is Allah, the khalik, the creator. And he wanted to be known that we have no control even in our, over our own body. This body, 
your body, we have no control over it. And Allah says deteriorate, it's going to deteriorate. And then doctors will find reasons why we died. Just that's how it has been written. That's why we need to pay heed. And as we get into this new Islamic year and this new month of Muharram, we need to do what is better for ourselves. Because that is what Allah wants to see, our good deeds. So inshallah, bi'ithnillah, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the second khutbah, we want to remind ourselves, I want to remind myself and you, on the, the concept of making a change in life, inshallah, to be a better Muslim, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us jannah or paradise without reckoning, inshallah. Wa akhira da'wan, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Why do we let these radical imams brainwash some of us? We come here, we sit, we sleep in khutbahs, we don't get the message, that's why we miss it. All I need you to be grateful, Allah. Alhamdulillahi na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'ghafiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyiyati a'malina ma yahdihillahu falamudillala wa ma yudlilhu falahadiyala wa nashhadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika la wa nashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh once more, we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to be here today to perform the Salat al-Jum'ah and to listen to the khutbah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahabihi ajma'een and upon his family members and companions inshallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon each and every one of us to shower his Hidayah, his guidance upon us, to shower his forgiveness upon us, and to shower his acceptance upon us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our coming here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our salah, our dua, our supplications, and all our amal and good deeds. Feast of Allah, inshallah. To continue on the concept of our amal. In the Holy Quran, in Surah Mulk, chapter 67, ayah, verse number 2. Everybody hear it all the time and we're reminded all the time. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاتَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala. Allah has created life and death, and Allah is the one who has a control over life and death, gives life and death. And he has designed this body, life, death, health, sickness. He has given some of us wealth, test, trial, strength, trial. He has given us life. To see who will make good use of their life and have good deeds. He has given some of us wealth to see who will put our wealth to good use. He has given some of us ilm and education to see who will put their knowledge towards good use. He has given some of us strength to see who will put our strength towards good use. Who is best indeed amongst you? He has given some of us power and authority to see who would use it in the right way and be best in deeds. Very interesting. Unfortunately, today, brothers and sisters, we live in a very sad time. And I know a lot of people think that I criticize when I talk about houses and cars and motor cars and jobs and money and wealth and university degrees. But I don't criticize that. I'm just reminding myself and you that our mission in life is not to run behind those things. If we run behind and we worship God, 
Those things will come automatically as we do the basic. We work, we marry, we do the necessities. Those things will come. But don't make that the objective of life. That's not the purpose of life. Let me ask you a question, and myself. When you go to university, and, and I know people think that I try to tell people don't have a degree, don't have a big house, don't have a nice car. Listen, that's not it. Allah says enjoy his bounties. But don't go into israf and extravagance. Innam al Do whatever you do for the, through ikhlas and sincerity for the pleasure of Allah. Your nice car shouldn't be to compete with your family and friends and neighbors. Your big house shouldn't be to compete for people to think, I have a big house, I'm better than everybody else. Your university degree shouldn't be to let the family and relatives and society know I got a doctorate, boy. The purpose has been lost. The intention is wrong. So there is no barakat. Yes, we serve Allah. Allah says, I did not create you and the jinnat except for ibadah. To worship Allah. The purpose should be to worship Allah. Get married, have a job, get knowledge. All these are necessities in life. So do it and Allah will put barakat. But don't make those things the objective in life. The objective is Allah. Allah wants to see who amongst us are best indeed. Let me ask myself and you a question as I was about to do a little while ago. When you go to university, to the college, and you finish your five years or your one year, your three years or your two years or whatever years you go for. Do you think they give you examinations on what kind of car you drive to come to school? Do, is your examination based on that? Is your examination based on what kind of house you live in at home? I mean, I'm telling you what you do, you, you, we do right here. Is your examination based on what kind of house your father lives in? Your university or college, BCC or FIU or UM, the exam, the imtihan, the test, is it based on what kind of food you eat? That you eat biryani and this guy eats chapati? And you eat lamb and this guy gets no lamb? So you will have a better exam than the poor guy? Is it like that? I, I've never heard like that unless some of you got no otherwise. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test us on the day of Qiyamah, He's not going to be concerned about the house we live in and the doctorate we have and the PhD we have and what D and what B and what MMS and as I always say, what AAS and what AA we are. That is for here, not there. That is for on earth, not in the earth. When you go down in the grave, Allah doesn't want to know about that. So we need to wake up. We're in this new Islamic year. Very interesting year. Change our lives. Be better. That's what the test is going to be. We'll die tomorrow. What is going to happen? We brainwash our children that life is all about the dunya. If they die before they get the dunya, what are they going to tell Allah? My father taught me the only thing in life is house and car and money and a degree. What's going, Allah is going to tell you, the father, I gave you a son. I gave you a son. What did you do with him? Ibrahim was begging for a son. Mina Salehin from amongst the righteous. Allah said, I give you a son. What you did with your son? Hmm? You taught him that the dunya is more important than the life after? You taught him that the makhluk and the creation is more important than the khalik, the creator? Come on. We need to understand the vision. When you have a job, whether you're a, a worker or a doctor or a lawyer or an accountant or a businessman or a teacher, or whatever we are, do you think they pay you a salary based on the car you drive? Yeah, do they? Your boss pay you a salary based on the house you live in? It doesn't work like that. In fact, the bigger the house and the money you have, you're going to have problem in America now with your taxes. So now people got to hide the kind of cars they have. They got to hide the money they have. They're going to put it in somebody else's account. They're going to send it into another country, and they could be locked up for money laundering. 
So now you can't even show off with the money you have. Come January 2013, you hear the cliff we're talking about, you're going to fall over the cliff. Be careful. That's first reality. Do you listen to the news? You know what's happening with President Obama and the country? And the laws of taxes? You can't even show off with your wealth anymore. You're going to have to hide it or send it back to Pakistan and Bangladesh and Guyana and Trinidad or put it in somebody else's account. And boom, they take all your money and tell you, Assalamu alaikum, buy it in my account. Allah is teaching us a lesson with all the degree we have. You know, it's unfortunate to know. One wise man has said that this dunya, this world, This world, prominence in this world, or recognition and status in this world, is based on your wealth and your degree. That's reality. But prominence and status in the next world is based on what? On your amal. On our armal, Allah looks at our piety, our deeds. That's what he looks at. Unfortunately today, and I know sometimes when I say this, I sound a little too harsh and people think he's a radical imam and he's too harsh and he's in a different world. Well, yeah, I live in a different dimension, if you want to think that. I'm probably mad or something. But I'm only saying it behind the Quran and the Prophet wasallam. But think about it. People used to call the Prophet wasallam mad, didn't they? Nabai? Didn't they accuse him to be majnoon? That's why Allah says he is not majnoon. Don't think he's mad. He's telling you what Allah has revealed. So people think we are mad when you talk about Allah and his Rasul. We live in a foolish world. With all the sense we have sometimes. If we don't go according to the Quran. A few weeks ago we reminded ourselves. Keep the Quran in front of us. Not in the back of us. Live based on what this Quran expects us to live by. This Quran doesn't forbid us from getting married. This Quran does not forbid us from getting a degree. Some people think I tell people don't get a university degree. This Quran doesn't sub prohibit you from having a good house and a good car. No. Islam is designed. You got a, a, a pillar in Islam that is based on wealth. So this Quran does not tell you not to have wealth. A pillar in Islam is based on wealth. So how could one of the pillars of Islam be zakat, wealth, purifying your wealth when wealth if wealth does not exist in Islam. So I cannot tell you wealth does not exist in Islam and knowledge and education. But we're saying let the objective be for Allah. Whatever wealth, whatever knowledge, whatever power we have, make sure we use our life, our time, our youth, our wealth, our health, our strength for Allah. Enjoy your wife, enjoy your wealth, enjoy your family, enjoy the dunya. But don't live for the dunya. That's, the bottom. That's what Allah wants to see in us. Look at how life is interesting. Eh? Think, do some pondering. Do you see birds have a university degree? How many birds you see came out of BCC College and FIU? Cats. Dogs. Interesting, eh? Allahu Akbar. But birds eat every day. And the sustenance is provided for them. And they didn't have to get a degree to get food. They didn't have to get a degree to get a house. They didn't have to get a degree to, to know how to be born. When a bird is being, when, when a cat or a dog comes into this world or a bird or fishes, Allah has given them the natural knowledge and education to know how to swim, how to eat, how to fly. Did you see any birds go to Perry, um, what do you call this airport here? Perry airport? Have you seen any birds go there to learn to fly? I see human beings go there to learn to fly. See birds smarter than us? Because Allah gave them that knowledge. And Prophet Sulaiman was blessed with the knowledge of the birds. Who gave that degree and knowledge to the birds? Subhanallah. Now I'm not saying again, I'm saying. So therefore, whatever we learn and we have and we do, we must thank Allah and he will better us in what we are. You live in a country today with thousands, is it thousands of jobs at loss or millions? 
Millions, lawyers, doctors, businessmen, accountants, teachers, no jobs. All the degree they have, they have no job. Face reality, I ain't telling you that the president told you that, Romney told you that, Bob, uh, the governor and President uh, Obama, and everybody tell you that. The media tell you that. Let's face reality, man. It is Allah who gives the jobs, not your degree. Yes, you need to make the effort for the degree and have the thing. I'm not saying no. But don't miss the point. Allah is the one. I was telling him about dogs and cats and fishes and birds. And look how interesting it is. Eh? I go around and travel in America all over the place. And sometimes I see people with degrees and doctorates and big houses and plenty money. And here what happens. They become dog feeders. What do you call that? Well, they're going to have to have a degree and to feed the birds. They go get a degree and the, the birds get a degree, university degree person to feed them. Cats, they're taking care of cats. They leave the will in the name of a cat and a dog. Even the animals have become better than us. You, gotta be, you, you have qualified people serving them. And what they do, they serve Allah. Let's let face reality. The birds and the cats and the dogs and the fishes, they serve Allah. That's why the Prophet says, when a person is in the path of Allah, the fishes make dua for them. Fishes in the sea make dua for the people who are in the path of Allah. And the university degree people got to go buy the food and feed the kitten and feed the dog and feed the fishes to make dua for them. That's a little reality, by Do some pondering. Fikir is important. That's why Allah gave us a brain, you know, to think. Mm -hmm. Because prominence in this world is based on wealth and degree. Prominence in the hereafter, the akhirah, is based on amal. That's what Allah will question us on in the hereafter. It's a serious situation. And I, and, and I, I, I remind myself anew, because last week we started talking on this verse of the Quran, and that's what I'm continuing on from chapter 16. Ayah number 19, which Allah says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in Allah, Ya'amur bil Adi wal Ihsan, wa ita idil Kurba, wa yenha in al Fahsha, wal Munkari wal Bag. Ya'idhukum la Allah kum ta the Karun. What does Allah say? That He commands justice, He commands good, Ihsan. That's why the verse again comes back. Li yablu akum ayyukum ahsanu amala. Ihsan. Allah commands us to do good. Allah checks on us on the day of judgment to see who has good deeds. Ah, that's important. That makes a difference for us in this world and the hereafter. And then Allah continues to say, And who keep good relationship with their parents, their family members, their relatives, and everyone. We started talking about that last week. Today, some of us, as we get the wealth, and we get the degree, and we get the position, and we get the better car, and we get the bigger house, we have no love anymore for children and parents and relatives and everybody else. Some people get married and decide they're going to marry the house, so they're not going to make children to live in the house. They're so stupid, they forget the purpose of marriage. As though the house is your wife, or the house is your husband. That's what you got to mind, that's what you got to live with. So you don't want to make children to live in that house. Are we thinking? Have we lost the purpose of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam? Because we get so much into this monkey see, monkey do dunya that we follow in everybody. We live in a dog and cat life. Human beings have become like that now. When Allah has created us in the best of form. Allah says that he has created us in the best of form. But we could come down to the lowest of the low. When our mission, when our vision is off track. And that's what Allah is saying here. He instructs you that ye, that he instructs us to stay away from shameful deeds, justice, good relationship with family, relatives, parents, do good. And he says here, that ye, he instructs you that ye may be reminded and take admonition that we will do that. Brothers and sisters, Unfortunately, I know a lot of us, you know, I was going to make a point a little while ago, and I know it might sound a little hard for some of our religious so-called minded people. 
Let me think a little bit to say it before some of you get angry at me. But it doesn't matter if you get angry at me or not. <laughs> this is not an elected position. See, President Obama didn't want to get anybody angry before during his first four years. Now he's going to get them the whip. Fire higher. Do as I say. I'm the boss. Now come what may, I'm going to be there for four years. Anyhow, point I'm getting at here. Everybody, millions of jobs, people have all the degrees in the world to get, right? And you don't have jobs in America. Think about this sad situation that exists in the lives of Muslims. And some of us pray Salah, we go to Hajj, we fast, and we do everything, but we have missed the vision. You know how many masajid needs imams? You know how many jobs openings there are? Take right here in South Florida, I would not call names. You take a trip from West Palm Beach to Homestead and see how many masajid do not have an imam. Hmm? How many masajids, mosques and Islamic centers want an imam? Want a sheikh or a leader? But you know what? Nobody wants those jobs. Why? That job is a job of the akhirah. We all running down the job of the dunya. And Allah saying, I ain't gonna give you no job. You think President Obama and Governor Romney will give you the job? Go. Let them give you the job. Wait. How many parents here try to tell our children to study? You know how many people I know? Like, as I told you already, I, had, I was promised by universities to be given honorary degree to get an MA to get a doctorate but am I going to work and let a president of a college be my boss Allah is my boss I could travel all over the world and do dawah when the president pays you and he's your boss you can't even come for Juma on time how am I going to deliver khutbah you know how many friends I have who have doctorates and who studied with me and gave up their university jobs to go in the part of Allah to become imams and become sheikhs I told you already, Dr. Zakir Naik is a well-known medical doctor. And he said when he read that verse that who is better than he who invites to Allah, he has his degree as a doctor, but he chose to go and do what has the best profession, invite people to Allah. Because there is a need for that. You know how many centers in America need imams? I have people calling me all the time in Al-Hikmat office, they want an imam, they want an imam. Yeah, they could get two by two imams, but they want qualified imams. But we all are not concerned of making our children and ourselves qualified imams. Qualified sheikhs and qualified leaders. And Allah is saying, no, you don't want to do that. You don't want a job of the hereafter. You only want the dunya job. All right. You only want to make your children. And you know what's a sad thing? We want to make our children and ourselves dunya degree people, but yet we want to go around the masjid. How do you like that? You have no clue of a masjid. You have no clue of how to run the masjid. You have no clue of an Islamic school. No clue of a Darululum, but you want to run it. You don't have the degree for that. We need to encourage people to become Islamic leaders. America, right? Forget about other countries. Uh, yes, you have a lot of hafiz and a lot of this and a lot of that. But how many people you have with the ability to lead communities? How many imams you have who can do dawah to non-Muslims? How many imams you have who can expound the Quran? How many imams you have who can be able to build a community? Who can keep the community? You need people like that and we see that the country has so many millions who have lost jobs and there are so many jobs available in Islamic centers and mosques. Muslims are not taking those jobs because we all a bunch of dunya runners. And I'm telling you, some of these imam jobs are paying $5,000 a month. Sometimes you make better money there than... In fact, you make better money because you get this dunya and you will also get the hereafter. And let me tell you something. An imam is not just a two-by-two -two person. Eh? He starts from when the child is born. He teaches you from the day how to call the adhan. And bury you when you die. I had a rabbi friend that lived here, Rabbi Konigsberg. 
He said some of these dunya runners people think their worldly materialistic degrees make them somebody. But let me tell you something. He said when someone is born, they call us. When they're sick, they call us. When the wife is pregnant, she wants to know whether she could pray or she can't pray. When she's in monthly, she wants to know whether she could or not. When you're going to get married, you've got to deal with them. When they're going up, you need to know what's going on. When they die, you've got to deal with them. When they die and go in the grave, you've still got to pray for them. This is a profession from birth to death. And we all choose this little part-time profession to go and work eight to four for a few dollars because it has worldly status. That's what I meant by the wise man saying that in the world, in the dunya, wealth and worldly recognition is what we look for for status. But in the hereafter, it is our amal and our good deeds that Allah wants to see. I'm not saying don't have degrees. You choose a part of Allah, and believe me, Allah will provide. Look at the Prophet ﷺ. He had a university degree, but Allah gave him a wealthy wife, Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. He walked into money. Allah will provide it for you. He was born an orphan. You want to get a better example than him? He was born an orphan. People thought he had nothing. He would have nothing. What kind of leader would he be when all the people were chiefs and leaders and they were known for their money and their prominence and their wealth? He was born an orphan. No money, no wealth. But Allah sent a wealthy woman into his life. He started his dawah move. And Allah sent a wealthy man to be his friend. Who was his best friend? Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala. And who wasn't he wealthy? He had a son-in-law, of son-in-laws. But who was Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu? Ghani, the wealthy. Allah sent money into his path. He didn't go and say, well, I have to do this and do that to make money. You can't want to have the two dunya at the same time, the two worlds at the same time. You do Allah's work and Allah will provide this. If we have Iman in Allah, we, must be, we have to believe that. Moses, Moses, and I'm going to conclude inshallah. Moses was supposed to be a dead boy, an Auzubillah. Wasn't that the command from Pharaoh? Kill all newborn baby boys was the order of Pharaoh. What Allah did to him? His life and mission was to spread the message of Allah. Allah brought him up in a kingdom, the kingdom of Pharaoh. Look at where he was brought up. Allah provided, caused the kafir to take care of him to be the leader of the world. Allahu Akbar. Think of Yusuf alayhi salam. You know, you're talking about tent of Muharram and Muharram. Go back into some of these incidents. Huh? Allah sends his help when you're in the part of Allah. Why do we read this Quran and these stories in the Quran? Not so that we will get iman and change our life. And as, as I was saying in the beginning of the khutbah for those brothers and sisters who came late, you could get a CD or the DVD after Juma, inshallah. We are today the second day of Muharram, a new Islamic year. This is our new year. This is our Islamic New Year, not the 1st of January. Now is when you change your life. Now is when we make a whole different vision. And I'm comparing reality of millions of jobs. People have degrees and can't get jobs. And I'm showing you where there are Muslim jobs available, but Muslims don't want it because it doesn't give status to be an imam. And our prophets were the imams. Wasn't that their title? Didn't Ibrahim make that dua? For his progeny to be a himma, leaders. The Quran, we hear the dua of your progeny to be a himma, leaders and imams. And we say, me, I want that poor man position, boy. I'm going to make my child a dunya dar. That has status. Allah could take your son before he gets the degree. And then say, oh gosh, I made a mistake, Allah. Allah said, you didn't make a mistake. It was too stupid. You didn't listen to me when I told you. We see that all the time. And to conclude again, Yusuf wasalam, he was thrown into a well. His stepbrothers thought that he will be history. That will be the end of him. What Allah did? Boom. He became the highest after the king in authority in Egypt. Because his life was Allah. His mission was Allah. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, here, America, you have a lot of opportunities. Use your doctorate. Use your engineering degree. Use your wealth. Use your positions. 
to be in the path of Allah, to propagate this Islam like the prophets. We are only hypocrites when we say we want to follow the footstep of the prophet. And when it comes to it, we say not really to follow the footstep of the dunya people here. That has status in the eyes of people. We live a status life for the dunya. Let us live for the akhirah. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And I've got to conclude again and remind you of chapter 33, verse 36. Last week I told you of that verse. Go check it out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has strongly, strongly, you could disagree with me, and I have no problem in you disagreeing with me, but I need to quote the verse so that we make sure you understand before you utter a word and before we utter a word. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنًا إِذَا قَضَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ أَمْرًا أَيَّكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْسِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَرَ ظَلَّ ظَلَالًا مُبِينًا When it is not fitting for a Muslim, believing man or believing woman, when Allah and his Rasul have made a decision, don't voice your opinion. And say that was the Prophet in his days, and that was Abraham in his days, peace be upon him. Allah has strongly forbidden us to voice our opinions on what Allah has designed, what the Prophet ﷺ has exemplified. Do not even voice your opinion. Go check the verse or take the CD after. Chapter 33, verse 36. Don't even voice your opinion contrary to Allah and His Rasul. So before we go and say, well, that verse is garbage and what the Prophet did is, we don't have no Khadija nowadays and we have no Pharaoh and king that will come away these days. Don't be, don't be very careful of what you say with your tongue because the adab could fall on us. Because that's what the Kufar used to do. They used to mock the Prophet وسلم, and the Quran and say those things are not true and this wouldn't happen and that wouldn't happen. That's what Allah warned us about. Go check Surah. Check what happened to Lahab. And then Allah says, Allah wa rasulahu Allah mubina. And anyone who voices their opinion and disobeys Allah and His Rasul, they are surely and clearly on Allah. So I don't want to be very careful. Maybe that's why you notice I am even scared to even quote hadith sometimes. I try to give direct from the Quran to myself and you. Because Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it is written in his life that he had 500 a hadith compiled. 500! Who? Who? Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the man who traveled with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the father-in-law of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the friend of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the first Khalifa of Islam. He had 500 a hadith that he compiled. But out of fear that he will misquote the Prophet ﷺ, he destroyed it. Remember that. And I, see, I hear a lot of us sometimes with our little dunya degree and a few dollars in our pocket, we try to voice our opinion over the Quran and the Rasul and the Islamic teachings. Be very careful. Because if he did that, we have no authority to mess around. Be very careful, inshallah. Ya Allah, ya Rahman, Rahman, ya Kafur, Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, we thank thee for all the favors and bounties you have bestowed upon us. We ask thee, Ya Allah, to send your peace and blessings unto the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We ask thee, Ya Allah, as we enter into this new Islamic year and in this blessed month of Muharram, and today is the second of Muharram, to bless us and guide us and protect us, Ya Allah. And help guide us to better deeds and amal and help us to live a better life, Ya Allah. And give us all the good in this world and the good in the hereafter. Help us to live for your pleasure, to obey your laws of the Quran, and to try to follow the sunnah of the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa kina Allah banar wa sallallahu ta'ala ala khayri qalqahi bi rahmatika ya rahman rahmin. Inna allahu malaikatuhu yisalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل محمد بعدد من صلى الله وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا مولانا محمد وعلى آل محمد بعدد من قعد وقام وصل على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى كل ملائكتك المقربين وعلى إباد الله صالحين برحمةك يا رحم الرحيمين إباد الله إن الله يعمل بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغ يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله تعالى أعلى وأولى وعز وجل Allahumma wa akbar Allahu akbar ki muslim We let these radical imams brainwash some of us
come here, we sit, we sleep in khutbas, we don't get the message, that's why we miss it. all I need you to be grateful, Allah. Are you telling me Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not protect the, the prestige of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam only living for business? That's all our dreams. Let me see who shall save you now.